Hello and welcome to Back to the Science. I'm Dr. Susan Oliver and I'm a scientist and back there is my assistant, Julie Oliver, and she's a dog. And if you're wondering why I'm looking a bit hot and bothered, it's got nothing to do with what I'm going to be talking about. It is so hot and humid in Sydney at the moment. It's ridiculous. Anyway, quite a few people have asked in the comments about the recent CDC paper that looked at the risk of hospitalisation in those who had been previously infected or vaccinated compared with unvaccinated people. So in this video, we will be looking at that paper and what it actually shows compared with what some people are claiming it shows. And we will also be looking at a few other papers showing the downsides of so-called natural immunity. But first, I'd like to address the term natural immunity. When people use this term, they usually mean immunity following infection. But this is a misnomer because whether you get immunity from an infection or from vaccination, it is your body's natural adaptive immune system that provides immunity. So both forms of immunity are natural. And indeed, in the CDC paper, they don't refer to it as natural immunity. So let's go back to the science now and have a look at the paper. So this is the paper, and in it they analysed data from California and New York in terms of COVID infections and hospitalisations. The time period that was covered was from 30th of May to the 20th of November 2021. They looked at four groups of people, or cohorts if you want to sound sciencey. First cohort was people who had survived a previous infection and were unvaccinated. Next, people who had survived a previous infection and were then vaccinated. Then people who hadn't been previously infected and hadn't been vaccinated. And finally, people who hadn't been previously infected but had been vaccinated. Now, I'm going to be concentrating on the hospitalisation figures. And there's three reasons for this. Firstly, preventing hospitalizations is much more important than preventing infection. Secondly, the authors admit that the infection figures aren't accurate because not all infections are captured. And thirdly, now with Omicron, infection figures from the alpha and delta wave aren't particularly relevant because we know that we're now seeing huge amounts of immune escape in terms of infection from both vaccination and previous disease. Hospitalisation figures were only available for California, and the authors provided the figures in two-week segments. In the text, they highlighted two sets of figures. Firstly, the 13th of June to the 26th of June, which was in the pre-Delta period, and there, compared with hospitalisation rates amongst unvaccinated people without a previous COVID infection, hospitalisation rates were 27.7-fold lower amongst vaccinated people without a previous COVID infection, six-fold lower amongst unvaccinated people with a previous COVID infection, and 7.1-fold lower amongst vaccinated people with a previous COVID diagnosis. The other time period they highlighted was between the 3rd and the 16th of October, which was during the Delta wave. And in this time period, compared with hospitalisation rates amongst unvaccinated, not previously infected people, hospitalisation rates were 19.8-fold lower amongst non-previously infected vaccinated people, 55.3-fold lower amongst previously infected unvaccinated people and 57.5-fold lower amongst previously infected vaccinated people. And the numbers in brackets are the 95% confidence intervals for the information. And the larger the number range here, the less confidence we have that the number is correct. So in the case of those with previous infections, we can see that there is a lot of imprecision in the numbers. Now, if we just concentrate on the figures in the bottom row, it would appear that immunity following infection is superior to immunity following vaccination. And quite a few YouTubers and commentators who have covered this paper are making this claim, with some even going, going so far as to claim people should be seeking immunity through infection with Omicron. Now, not everyone is actually going that far. But there is definitely a lot of people getting very excited about so-called natural immunity. If this study was actually a randomised controlled trial, it would be valid to compare these figures and draw these conclusions, but it isn't. It's an observational study, and that means you are not comparing four similar groups of people. You are comparing groups with significant differences, both in their characteristics and in their behaviour. And you need to consider these when evaluating the results. And I'll just take you through a couple of examples of the differences in the groups. 
In this study, the vaccinated group of people who had one dose of J&J or two doses of Pfizer or Moderna, importantly, to be included in the analysis, people had to have completed their vaccination course by the 16th of May 2021. So for the one dose J&J, that just means they had to have had this dose by the 16th of May. But for Pfizer, they had to have had their first dose by the 25th of April and for Moderna by the 18th of April. Why does this matter? because all people in California only became eligible for vaccination on the 15th of April. And even over 50s with no comorbidities only became eligible on the 1st of April. Prior to this, the only people eligible for vaccination were those over 65, those with comorbidities and those in specific professions. And this means that the vaccinated cohort in the study will be skewed towards these people. Now, the authors of the study did adjust the results for age, which is good, but they didn't adjust for comorbidities, which we know increase your chances of hospitalisation. So what this means is the vaccinated cohort in the study is skewed somewhat towards people who are more likely to be hospitalised. How much it is skewed, we don't know because the data isn't provided. And that's possibly because it's not actually available. So that's the vaccinated group. But this isn't the only group where the data is skewed. The two previously infected cohorts are also skewed, but in the opposite direction. As we know, not everyone survives COVID. So the people who didn't survive are no longer available to be reinfected and hospitalised. In other words, a lot of people who are most susceptible to hospitalisation from COVID have already been removed from the previously infected cohorts. So those who are left are skewed to people who are less susceptible. And just to give you an idea of the numbers, this is a meta-analysis that looked at the mortality rate amongst people who were hospitalised with COVID. And overall, they found that the mortality rate amongst those hospitalised was 17%. So that's a fair chunk of susceptible people that had been removed from the previously infected group. So unlike in a randomised controlled trial where all groups have similar characteristics, in this study we've got a vaccinated group that's skewed towards people who are inherently more likely to be hospitalised and a previously infected group that is skewed towards people who are inherently less likely to be hospitalised. And it is therefore simply not valid to compare their hospitalisation rates and claim that they show so-called natural immunity is better. Now, just to be clear, I'm not criticising the fact that this study isn't a randomised controlled trial. It would be totally unethical to do a randomised controlled trial where you deliberately infected people with a potentially fatal virus. And we can get important information from observational studies. This figure, which comes from the study, compares the hospitalisation rate per 100,000 person days for the four cohorts. And it's pretty clear that even with confounders, there is a difference between the non-previously infected unvaccinated group, which is the solid blue line at the top, and everyone else. But the difference between the other three cohorts, which are the dotted lines down the bottom, is not so clear. One other important point is this study primarily included people who had received only one dose of the J&J vaccine or only two doses of the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. But of course, this is no longer the recommended dosing schedule as booster doses are now recommended. This is another reason why it is incorrect to claim superiority for so-called natural immunity, because this study wasn't comparing natural immunity with the now recommended dosing. And we know that the booster doses considerably decreases hospitalisation and death. And this chart here is just one example of this. It is comparing the weekly death rate per 100,000 people based on vaccination status in Switzerland and Liechtenstein, which I hope I've pronounced correctly. And the data has been age standardised to account for the different vaccination rates of older and younger people. And if you'd like to know more about the science behind booster doses, I've made a video about it. Another claim that is being made by some commentators about this study is that it is proof that you don't need to be vaccinated if you have already had COVID. Again, if this was a randomised controlled trial, that could be a valid point but it isn't. So we can't say that there is no benefit to being vaccinated after infection because we don't know if there are inherent differences in the two groups. It probably is the case for some people that vaccination following infection won't provide any additional benefit, 
but we know that the immune response following infection is highly variable. This study looked at antibody responses, which is also known as seroconversion, in 7,256 people in the UK who had tested positive for SARS-CoV-2. And they found that 24% didn't actually develop a detectable antibody response following infection. Those who didn't seroconvert were more likely to be older, have milder disease or have higher CT values. But this wasn't definitive. And interestingly, comorbidities weren't a factor that made a difference. So if you've had COVID, you may be one of the 76% who seroconverted or one of the 24% who didn't. With vaccination, the response is much more uniform. Now, there are some people who are going even further and actually suggesting that you should aim to be infected, particularly with Omicron as an alternative to vaccination. You know, maybe have a COVID party. The claim is that by getting infected with the so-called mild Omicron, you will be protected against more serious variants like Delta. Now, I've already covered in previous videos that there is no evidence that Omicron is mild, so I won't go into that again. But of course, you can watch the videos if you haven't seen them. And I'll put a link in the video's description. What we are going to look at now is some evidence that suggests that getting infected with Omicron may not actually protect you against other variants anyway. This paper is still a preprint, which means it hasn't been peer reviewed yet, but it has come from a very reputable lab. What they did in this study was they looked at the ability of sera from people who had been infected with Omicron to neutralize either Omicron or Delta virus. And they specifically compared the results from vaccinated and unvaccinated people. And the vaccines were either Pfizer or J&J. This figure summarizes the results. And it's important to know that it is a log scale. So changes are larger than what they appear at first glance. Figures A and B look at immunity against the Omicron virus over time. And we can see that on average, for those who are vaccinated, neutralization increased from 28 to 378, which is a 13.7 fold increase. But for those who aren't vaccinated, it only increased from 26 to 113, which was a 4.4 fold increase. Figures C and D do the same thing except for the Delta virus. And here the difference is even more stark. In the vaccinated, neutralization increased from 129 to 790, which was a 6.1 fold increase, but it only increased to 46 in unvaccinated individuals. And the increase wasn't statistically significant. So based on this study, if you're vaccinated, getting infected with Omicron will increase your neutralizing antibodies against Delta. But if you're not vaccinated, it won't. And of course, you can also increase your antibodies against both variants by getting a booster and skip getting sick. This preprint, which is from a different research group, also had similar findings to the paper I just discussed. In this study, as well as looking at the neutralization capacity of sera from people, they also did some experiments in mice. And they found that if they infected transgenic mice with human ACE2 with the Delta variant, they had broad neutralizing capacity against other SARS-CoV-2 variants of concern. But this wasn't the case in mice infected with Omicron. Now, this is in mice and mice aren't people, but it is consistent with the findings of the previous study. So people suggesting that Omicron is a natural vaccine that will protect you against other supposedly more deadly variants aren't basing their opinions on the science. But deliberately getting infected with Omicron isn't just pointless, it can have other unwanted consequences. We have already discussed the risk of hospitalisation and death with COVID, and this, of course, gets lots of coverage everywhere. But what gets less coverage is the fact that even after you've recovered from COVID, your risk of death is higher than someone who hasn't had COVID. In this study, they compared the mortality rate of people who had tested positive for SARS-CoV-2 with the mortality of people who had tested negative over a period of 12 months. They excluded any deaths that occurred within 30 days of testing positive or release from hospital so that they weren't capturing deaths from acute COVID. And the data was also adjusted for age, sex, race, ethnicity and comorbidity. The patients all tested positive in the first wave of COVID, so this was before vaccinations were available. This table shows the mortality risk by COVID status over 12 months. 
And these are specifically deaths that aren't recorded as being COVID deaths. So for people who had mild to moderate COVID, we can see there is a trend towards an increased death rate over the next 12 months, but it isn't actually statistically significant, which means it could just be occurring by chance. It is quite different, though, for people who had severe COVID, and they define severe as requiring hospitalisation. So for these people, they had a 2.5-fold increase of dying in the next 12 months compared with people who hadn't had COVID. And it was 3.33 fold for people under 65 and 2.17 fold for people over 65. So the increased mortality risks with COVID extends beyond the acute infection stage and lasts at least 12 months amongst those who have had severe COVID. Of course, we all know that COVID isn't just a binary condition. The options aren't just living or dying. For a lot of people, ongoing issues, which are commonly known as long COVID, persist for much longer. Amongst the many long COVID symptoms reported is brain fog. Well, there is now some research showing that this is much more common than thought. In this study, they compared the cognitive ability of people who had recovered from a mild case of COVID with people who hadn't had COVID. These were young people with a mean age of 29, and in those who had recovered from COVID, they only included people who reported having no ongoing concerns after recovering from COVID. They measured the cognitive ability of the participants through 12 cognitive tasks designed to measure specific aspects of cognition, memory, attention, motor control, planning, and verbal reasoning abilities. Most cognitive abilities tested were normal, which is good, But COVID survivors showed impaired memory and a decline ability to maintain attention when performing tasks. Importantly, these were people who didn't think they were suffering from long COVID. So even if you think your mild COVID has had no effect on you, that's not necessarily the case. Now, the good news is after nine months, their cognitive ability was back to being the same as people who hadn't been infected. But Nine months is a long time to be below par in your cognitive ability. So in summary, intentionally getting infected with Omicron will not help with immunity against other variants and can do you harm. If you'd like to look further into the data that I've presented, I've provided links in the video's description. And please remember this video is about the science, but you shouldn't take it as medical advice. For that, you should speak to your medical practitioner. Thank you for listening. If you found this video useful, please hit the like button so that more people will see it. And if you'd like to see more videos about the science in the future, please hit the subscribe button.